I want to take you on a tour of various HTML elements that we're going to use all the time when we're working with HTML5. And I've pulled up the MDN element reference. And this is a great place for you to go and discover different elements that you can use and what they're meant for. So HTML is not about how the document looks. It's about the structure of the document, how we, how we break our content into sections, how we work with text. Uh, it's about how we do things with text that is in line, like inside a paragraph, for example. It's about how we work with multimedia and images. It's, the, it's all that sort of stuff, how we embed content. So what I thought I would do is I would take you on a tour and show you some examples of what you can do with HTML5. And uh, we'll just, we'll, 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 we'll build some examples and um, talk, talk about the syntax and how you do it. Okay, so we said that every HTML document needs to have a basic structure. So the structure is this. You start out with a doc type, and the doc type for HTML5 is HTML. You then need an HTML root element. The whole document is going to be contained inside of this element. So I'm going to expand this out because I'm going to put two things inside of the HTML element. I'm going to add a head, and I'm also going to add a body. So these two elements live inside of the HTML. Here's the head and the body. The head is where I'm going to put the metadata information about the page. So there's a couple of things we said we need to do. So inside here, I'm going to specify um, that I have a meta tag, and I need to say that the character set of my document is UTF-8. But you'll notice that I don't close my meta tag. I don't need to close it. The reason I don't need to close it is that there's no content inside of the meta tag. Meta tag doesn't have any information uh, in its in, inside the element. So it's called an empty element. We don't need to put anything there. So we don't close this tag. We'll talk more about that next week. I also need a title. And I'm going to say that the title of this is, let's call this um, experiments with experiments with HTML elements. And I'll save this. Now you notice that when I save this and I refresh my page over here, there's nothing displayed inside of the body because I don't have anything in the body. The body's there, but it's empty. However, I do have a title. The title of my document up here on the tab is experiments with HTML. So let's put something in the body. I said that every HTML document needs a a heading one. So I'm going to put in an H1 element and this will be the main title. So let's say main title of document. And I'll save that. And here's my here's my H1, main title of document. All right, so let's start adding more elements to what we know about. So these headings, there's lots of them. So that goes from one to six. So H2, this is an H2 element and an H3 element, H4, and H5, and H6. So you can see that each one of these gets progressively smaller. And if I, uh, whoops. Wrong window, this one over here. If I increase the size here, you can see that they, they grow and shrink proportional to each other. So the main, the H1 is bigger than the H2, is bigger than the H3, is bigger than the H4. So what a lot of people do when they're getting started is they use these headings as a way of setting font sizes because I know that an H5 is smaller than an H2. So what if I just did this? What if I said, uh, I'm gonna do uh, H1 and H5. That's how I want my document to look, like this. Okay, well, I don't want you to do that. I want, I want you to, to think about HTML as the structure of the document and the, the way that the content is being put together and the way to interpret the content, not the way that it looks. 
So what this is going to mean, this is going to be frustrating at first because your web pages are going to, well, I'll just say, they're, they're going to look like garbage. Like your web pages at the very beginning, they're not going to look good. They're not going to have the right fonts. They're not going to be laid out really, really, they're going to look like every other really basic web page. And you're going to think to yourself, this sucks. I don't, I don't like the way this looks. Don't worry about that. To begin with, what we're worrying about is how to structure our document. In a couple weeks, I'm going to uh, be teaching you CSS, and I'll take you through how we deal with the um, the layout, the fonts, the colors, how we place things, the spacing. We can control all of that stuff really, really accurately. So for for today, for the first few weeks, ignore all that. Okay, so back to this over here. So if I have an H1 in my document, the, the next thing that I'm gonna put in here can't be an H5 because the next thing after H1 is H2. So if I wanted to have another heading, like let's say a subheading, that would need to be an H2 in order to be correct. So what I want you to notice that when I say be correct, HTML will let me do this, but this is not valid HTML. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to build a document that has correct structure. And uh, it's not about how it looks, it's about how it's structured. And so here I really need H2 as the secondary, a secondary title is an H2. If I had a, if I had another H2, so I've got subheading one, whoops, and subheading two, I could do that. I could have many, many of these H2s all the way down. And if, so if, if I had inside of this section, if I had another one, I could do H3 and this would be sub subheading two, and then it goes you know deeper inside there. So I, I'm starting to get some more structure in here. So this is like building a table of contents, if you will. I can use these headings to be able to represent where things, like what's the flow of this? If I was gonna go back out and do another subheading, subheading three, I would do an H2. And so you can see that my document structure follows this pattern. Okay, so that's for working with titles. So let's talk about all the million ways we can work with text. First thing I'm gonna do when I need some text, whenever I'm writing a web page and I don't have any specific content that I, I wanna work with, what a lot of people will do is they'll put in Laura Mipsum. So I'm gonna to go to a Laura Mipsum generator here and you can get, I'm gonna ask, let's say for five paragraphs and I'll generate this and it'll give me five paragraphs of Laura Mipsum text. And what's nice about this is that it looks like text, but you're not tempted to read it. Your eye can't read it unless you read Latin Maybe you look at this and you're reading it. But for me, it just looks like text. And it's really useful when I'm trying to do a web design and I need to just have filler. I don't have content yet. I just have this kind of filler. All right, so let's go in here and let's under, I'm gonna make a section here called text like this. And let's under text, let's put in a bunch of paragraphs like so. So let me save this and show you what it would look like. So here is what this document looks like over here on the left here. It doesn't look the way I expected it to look. So it hasn't made these into five paragraphs. And the reason is that it doesn't matter how many lines you put here, HTML is gonna ignore them. Because lines don't they, lines aren't significant. White space isn't significant. What is significant is using markup. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify that this right here is a paragraph. This is the start of a paragraph. And if I go to the end of this paragraph and I paste in the end of the paragraph, watch the difference. So you can see that now it has created a paragraph. And as far as HTML is concerned, a paragraph has its own vertical space. So there's a little bit of space below it and a little bit of space above it. It's this block and it wraps the text for me. So if, I'm, if I were to change the window size, it maintains the fact that this is a paragraph. So what I need to do here is I need to put in paragraph, let me get rid of this, let me just do them all. So I'm gonna say this is a paragraph, this is a paragraph, this is a paragraph, like so. 
and this is a paragraph. And I need to I need to close these. So I need to say where where does this paragraph end? So this one ends here, this one ends here, this one ends here, and this one ends here. And if I save this, now I have one, two, three, four, I have five paragraphs. That looks like more like what I was uh, hoping to get. So my document has a title, a main title, it has a secondary title, and here I'm able to work with paragraphs. Okay, so now let's talk about other types of text that you can have other than paragraphs. So another type of text that you might want to put into a web page is something like this. An address. So imagine if I have um, let me put this up at the top so we can see where it is. I have an address. This text right here, I can actually say to the browser that this is an address. The address starts here and it ends here. And put in an address like this. Now, the the browser doesn't know what it, what the address is. Like it doesn't connect it to a place on Earth. So this is the address for Seneca's Newnham campus. But it's but you can see that what I'm doing is I'm differentiating a paragraph of text. So this is a paragraph of text. This is a title, a secondary title, H2, and this is an address. So I'm, I'm giving meaning to the text by wrapping it inside these markup tags and saying this is, you know, this is, um, this is my address. I could, if I wanted to, I could, I could tell the browser that I want to break the address after these commas. So if you wanted it to be on multiple lines, it normally doesn't put a break in here. Like if I were to get rid of this and put an enter here, it won't work because white space is not significant. So what you have to do is you have to say there is a break. There's a break here. And if you want, you can you could write your address like this. And then put the address over there. So that would work. So if I wanted to say here's an address and it's broken up into a bunch of lines like that. Okay, what other kinds of text do, do we work with? Uh, what about date and time? So if I said something like, um, you know, uh, 2020, uh, 07-11, something like that. So this is just this is just text. It doesn't have it doesn't have a meaning in the document, but I can give it a meaning by saying that this is a time. This is a time like so. And I can also use I could do something like this. I could say let's say this is you know, let's say we wanted to we wanted to show this as yesterday, yesterday, right? But what does yesterday mean? Well, we can say well, yesterday means a specific date and time, specific date and time, and we could say okay, it's 2020, 07, 11, or whatever. I'm just making up a date, but we could say it's yesterday, or we could say. Um, I could say something like tomorrow at 5 p.m. So we could say, you know, it's gonna happen, whatever, and the time is going to be 1700 hours. So you can see here that I have a bunch of dates. They come up as regular text, like there's nothing specific about like this time that you're seeing here, it's not visible in the page. 
it's embedded into the structure of the document. So it's possible for me to, to say, um, you know, that this is, this is happening tomorrow at five, right? But in the document, I can be more specific. I can use an HTML attribute to say, I'm gonna embed other kinds of time in there. So what we're doing here is we're, we're giving mean, more meaning to our text. We're saying, this is, this is an address, this is a date time, this is a paragraph, this is a title, etc. Now you also notice that these dates and times are all being displayed on the same line. So a concept that we're gonna talk about a lot is the idea of inline elements and block elements. So these paragraphs are block elements. You see how they get their own vertical space, their own block of space. See this heading? The heading gets its own block of space. Above and below it, it has space. But you see this? It doesn't get a block of space. It's, it's all in line. It's all in one line. If I ever wanted to turn this so that it had its own block, I could wrap it in a paragraph. So if I wanted to say this is a paragraph and inside it is a date and time, right? So what gets displayed in the page looks like this, but I can, I can wrap it. Or if I wanted to, I could say there's a break here. I need to break this so that it goes down. And you'll see how the difference between this one here and this one here is that there's this extra white space, this extra block of space above and below it, whereas this one doesn't have that, it just breaks the line. It just goes down to the next line. What else could we do with text? What other kinds of things could we deal with? Well, another thing we could deal with is, we could deal with an abbreviation. So let's say that I'm writing a document and I keep writing HTML. And that's fine if you know what HTML is, or I write CSS, that's fine if you know what CSS is. But what if I could put more information into the page and I could say that this is an abbreviation. HTML is an abbreviation. CSS is an abbreviation. And what if I could actually tell you what it means? What if I could say that it is the hypertext markup language? Or what if I could say that this is a cascading style sheet? You'll notice now that my browser gives me this little uh, gives me this little underline, and if I hold my mouse over it, it'll actually tell me what the abbreviation stands for. So when you're working with semantic markup, you are layering more information into the text. You're saying this isn't just the letters HTML. Like think about it. I could say. I could say HTML or I could say this. What's the difference? Let me move uh, let me move CSS down to its own line. Look at the difference between these two. This one is HTML. This one is HTML. They both rep they both show the same way, except that this one has a little more information. It has the definition of the abbreviation embedded into the document as well. Um, so we're trying to find ways to layer in more and more information. Okay, let's think about other types of text we could work with. Whoops. Another thing we work with a lot is code. Now you're a programmer. You're going to constantly be wanting to put code onto the web. So if I have something, a statement like this, printf, uh, hello world. I can put that up here, but I can also tell the browser that this is code. And you see now that what it's done is it has rendered it differently. So instead of having a, uh, let me do another one above it. Um, 
you can see the difference between these two, right? One has a fixed width font and one has this variable width font where the letter I is much, much thinner than the letter W. And so, but here, the letter I and the letter W are both the exact same width and they do that so that everything lines up perfectly. So whenever you're gonna put something that is code, so that could be HTML or, C or CSS that you want to display in the page, like if I wanted to put something in the page or if you wanted to write about C++ or C or Java or something like that, you would put it and you would say, this is, this is code and I want it to be displayed differently than I want the rest of the text to be displayed. Okay, that's good. What else could we deal with? We could deal with subscripts and superscripts as an example. So let's say for example that you wanted to talk about H2O. You know, you're talking about water. Or you wanted to talk about, uh, you want to talk about x squared, like that. How do I deal with subscripts and superscripts? How do I indicate that to the browser? Well, what I can do is I can say that this is a subscript. The two is a subscript. And I could say that this two here is a superscript. so that now it displays it the way that we expect with it being down below the baseline or up above. You can see that the squared here has been moved up. So we can, we can tell the browser, here's how I want this character to be displayed, that this needs to be displayed differently. We can do Things like we can put in quotes. So in a paragraph, I might say, this is a, I want to quote something. This is a, this is a quote. Well, I have a way of doing that. I can say that this is a quote like that. And I can also say, um, you know, that something is a longer quote. So if I have something that I want to have on its own line, I can say, I want to have a quote, but I want to have it be its own block. So I want to have a block quote. So you can see here that just like you would do in an essay, if you needed to quote something, um, we can do it in line and it lives inside of this paragraph. But we could also say, I want this quote to be inset a little bit. I want it to be on its own line. I want it to be moved over from the left side and I want it to be displayed like this. So this is a block quote. So we can work with quotes. There's all kinds of things we could do. We could also, if we wanted to, we could add, uh, we could add a citation. So we could say here, you know, um, cite. So this is a quote by Kent Beck, programmer Kent Beck. So if I wanted to add, I wanted to add him, I wanted to cite him and I wanted to put some information about where I got this, I could put the citation in there too. There's lots and lots of ways that we can um, modify the way that the text uh, reveals itself to the reader. So we can say that um, we, can, we can add various kinds of emphasis to the text. So if I have, um, let me grab a paragraph here. If I have a paragraph, I could say that this first word, for example, maybe I wanna make this, I wanna give this first word some emphasis. So I can use EM to say this first word should be emphasized. And you can see that when this paragraph renders, you can see how this is in italics, it's been emphasized. I could say that I want this second word to be made stronger I want it to stand out from the other text. And you can see how now this text here is bold. So I might use this if I'm if I have a warning message or I have some really important piece of information. Note, you know, um, so for example, I might say 
note and you know have it stand out make it stronger for the reader so that they can see what's going on when they look at this lots and lots of ways for us to work with text and say this text is special this is a paragraph of text this is an address of text this is a date and time this is an abbreviation this is a piece of code etc etc this is a quote i have lots of ways to layer meaning onto my content that's what this markup is allowing me to do okay so what else can we do with markup so another thing we can do is instead of having you know full paragraphs we can also work with lists, a couple of different types of lists. Both of them work in a similar way. So you first have to decide whether you want a list that is a bulleted list or do you want a list that is numbered in some way. So let's say we just want bullets. So we call a bulleted list an unordered list. And an unordered list is separate from an ordered list. So we have these two kinds of lists. So let's, an unordered list would be, let's say I wanted to have items in the list. So each item is a list item. So let's say I wanna have, I wanna have three colors, red, green, and blue. And in, and I'll do the same, I'll do the same for both of them so you can see how they look. And let's use our, our H3. So this is an ordered list. And this is a, an unordered list. And here's how they look. So automatically it's put things, you know, in a vertical orientation for me. It's given me a dot for an unordered list, or it's given me numbers. It's possible for you to control what you get. So if you wanted A, B, C, and so on, you can change all of that. So if you look, for example, at, a, um, at an ordered list, sorry, ordered, ordered list. If I could type, here's ordered list. You can change the type, um, you know, Roman numerals, um, you know, so if I said that my ordered list, the type is going to be equal to uh, Roman numerals, let's say. Well, then your page is going to look like this. Or if you're, if you want to use letters, lowercase letters, uppercase letters, etc. So you have various ways that you can specify uh, how your list is going to be displayed. And you can also you can also put lists inside of lists. So I, I could have another inside of this list item here. I could have another uh, ordered list. And so maybe I have another list item one, two, like so, and you'll see that uh, I can I can break this list up and um, you know have subsections within the list when I'm working through it. Uh, okay, let's move on to another another important idea. Hyperlinks. So one of the most important parts of working in hypertext is being able to use hyperlinks. And a hyperlink is where you want to have some, so I wanna have some text, for example, I wanna have uh, web 222 like this, but I wanna make web 222 clickable. So right now I can't click on web 222. So I'm going to make this clickable. What I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap it in an anchor tag. Like that. So when it's in an anchor tag, what I can do is I can specify that it has an href. So for example, https 
web222.ca. Now if I do this, you'll see that it becomes underlined. You'll see that my when I mouse over it, my mouse changes to the hand instead of uh, to a pointer. So instead of having this I-beam, like most text, you have this I-beam selection handle. But if you, if you go over top of a link, you get this hand, and if I click on the link, it's gonna take me to this page. So it's going to hyperlink me to another document on the internet. And if I go back, I land back here again. So when you're making a hyperlink, the way that it works is you say a href equals, and then this in here is some kind of a URL that you want to link to. And then what you put in here is the inner text to display. This is the text that you wanna show in the page to the user. So this is the thing that they can click. And when they click, this is where they will go. So there's different ways of doing this. You can do um, a hyperlink to another website using what's known as an absolute URL, that is an, a, a URL that begins with HTTPS or HTTP and it, and it goes on from there. So if you give an absolute URL, you're saying go to this, go to the computer at this domain and I wanna go to the index page, the main page. So I could write index.html, but it's common on the web that you don't do this. If you leave this off, this is generally where you'll end up. You'll end up at the index page. All right, what else could we do? We could also use what's known as a relative URL. So a relative URL begins with, um, it doesn't begin with HTTPS. So let me give you some examples. Let's say we had another page. I'm gonna make a second page, new file. Let's have another page called about.html. And over here, I'm gonna say, I'm not gonna write my whole page. I'll just say about like that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put another hyperlink here. I'm gonna say a href equals, and I'm gonna not say HTTP colon localhost 3000 slash index.html. So I could do this, that would work. But I could also say a href equals index.html. like that, or I could also say a href equals index.html. So these three are similar in the sense that this is an absolute URL that also includes the name of the machine that I'm on. So H I'm on localhost port 3000 index.html. This is a relative URL, which means go to the index.html page, which is on this machine, um, and it's beside me, like it's in the same directory that I'm in. Or let's make another page. If I had a, if I had a new folder, and I had a new folder called whatever, it's um, data, and inside data, I have another page in here called info.html info how would i get from info back to my home page well i'd have to do an anchor tag that links to i'd have to go up one level from where i am right now to get up above the data directory and then i could go to the index so that would look like dot dot slash index.html home. So these links are gonna be uh, done relative to where you are. A relative link is relative to the page. So over here, if I wanted to make a link, a href equals, let's make a link to the about page. I would say about.html, about, and if I wanted to say a href equals, if I want to link to the data page, I would say data slash info.html, or sometimes people will write it dot slash, which means in the current directory, go to the data directory, and then we go to info like this. So if I save this, 
you'll see that I now have three links, Web222, and these ones are blue because I've never been there. So if I click on About, it takes me to the About page. If I click on Home, it takes me back. If I click on Info, it takes me to the Info page. If I click on Home, it takes me back. So that's working with an absolute URL versus a relative URL. Now there's another kind that we can use here, and that is we can use, uh, we can link to an ID in the page, in the current page. So as an example, let's say that I wanted to be able to link down here to this address section in my document. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give this a name. I'm gonna say this is ID equals address. I'm gonna name this H2 because right now I have lots of these H2s. How do you differentiate one H2 from another? Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, this is the this one here is the address H2. And maybe this one right here is ID equals date and time. I'm gonna do that. So I'm gonna give a bunch of these things names so that I can link to them. How do you link to them? So when I create an A href equals, I'm going to start with this hash or pound sign, and then I'm gonna use the name of the ID. So this would be address and a href equals date and time, like so. So now if I, click on address, what it's gonna do is it's gonna scroll me in the current document. It's gonna jump down to the address section and it's also gonna change my URL. So my URL now has a fragment at the end that says I am at hash address. So if I hit the back button, I'm gonna go back to where I was. If I click on date and time, it's gonna scroll me. Did I mess up date and time? What did I do down here? Yeah, data. I need to be able to type properly. Date and time, and it scrolls me down to date and time. And if I go back, then I come up here and I do this. A lot of people will use this as a way to deep link into documents. Like you'll notice, for example, on the Web222 notes, if I go and I click on this link here, common HTML elements, it has now created a hash up here, common HTML elements. And this lets us deep link into a page. So if I give somebody this URL and I share it with them and they paste it in, it will go to that page, but it will scroll you down to that section automatically. So you're linking to a resource, but then you're linking deep into it, down into some further subsection of it. And we do that by using attributes on the element that we want to link to and by using these hashes before the name of the ID that we gave it. So when you're making a link, you use an anchor tag. The href is either an absolute URL, a relative URL relative to the current file, or it is a, an ID in the page that you're going to go to. Okay, let me show you a couple more things before we end here. Let's talk about media. So h2 media. And inside media, let me tell you about images. So an image is displayed. I mean, how do you put an image in here? We can't type an image, obviously. So what we have to do is we have to tell the browser that we want to display an image which is stored somewhere on the internet in this location. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say that I have an image that I wanna put right here. So if I, if I run this, uh, if I reload this now, like there's nothing there. There's no, there's no image here. So the way that you give the image something to load is you give it a source. Source equals, and then what you put in here is a URL. So if I were to do this, you'll see that I get a broken image because there is nothing at URL. URL isn't, there isn't an image at URL. I need to give it a valid URL. So whenever you see a broken image, it means that it tried to load this image and it couldn't. So it, it shows you that there's supposed to be an image here, but it's broken. Okay, well, I have an image that I wanna display in the page. I went and found an image of Toronto. 
and the URL for the image is this right here. So I want to be able to display this image in the page. So I'm going to save this and now it puts this image into my page like that. So you can see that the image gets placed like so and the image is, is fairly big, right? So when you're working with an image, I'm going to move this down so you can see there's my URL. So this URL here is just like the anchors. If you have a file that you want to link to that's somewhere else on the web, you just put an absolute URL in here. If you have a local image, like if this image was stored on my on the web server where I'm I'm currently working, then I would be able to grab that and I would be able to display it here. So I can use either either type of image when I'm uh, when I'm putting this in here. Let me let me show you what I mean. If I um, save this image and let's put it in to um, whoops, save this image. Uh, Toronto. Dot JPG. Let's save it there. Okay, so now I have a file here, Toronto.jpg, in my in my folder that I'm working with. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna modify my code, and instead of loading it from an absolute URL, I'm gonna modify this and I'm gonna do a relative URL. So I'm gonna put toronto.jpg and I'll save it. And now it's gonna load it from the same directory where this file is. It's gonna load it right beside here like that, okay? So absolute or relative URLs both work for the purposes of what we're trying to do here. When you're working with an image, another thing you can do is you can specify a width. So for example, I could say I want the width to be 200 pixels. So now you can see when this thing loads, it's only 200 pixels wide. Or if I were to say that I want this height to be equal to 50 pixels. Uh, or what if I say I want the width to be 2000 pixels and 50 wide. See how the image is getting really really garbled, it's getting skewed. So every image has an aspect ratio, that is the width to the height. So this image has a natural width and height that you wanna to, want to use. So for example, if I want the height to be 50, I shouldn't specify a width. The browser will figure it out for me. Or if I say I want the height to be 500 pixels, the browser automatically figures out how wide to make it in order for this height to work. So what you should do is you should either do the width, width equals 350, 350, right? Or width equals 800, like that, 600, like that. And then let the browser figure out what the other dimension should be. Don't specify both dimensions when you're doing this. Or if I say height equals 600, you see how it's it's been flattened? So this image is not a square, it's a rectangle. And it needs to, or if I said this is 75, if I were to, let's try stretching this out. This is gonna get stretched if I said nine, 975. It's just, that it's getting stretched taller and taller and I don't know, it's not the natural height that it should be. The natural height that it should be for the pixels that we have, it should look like that when you're gonna go there and put this in there. All right, let's look at another media type. We can also do audio and video. So video or audio, and they work the same way. I'll demonstrate video because it's hard for me with my current setup, I don't have sound uh, connected in here. So I'll just do the video. So if you wanna put a video on the page, what you do is just like an image, we put an image like this, but with a video, we do this. We say video, and a video has an opening and a closing tag like this. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify here, I'm going to specify my source equals. Same idea. So I have a video that I'm going to play. So I'll paste it here and I'll save this. And now you're going to see that I'm going to have this big video that pops up on my page like this. Okay. Now the video is not playing and there's no way to make this video play yet because I didn't enable that. So first thing I'm going to do is the size of this is ridiculous. So let's change the size of this. Let's say that I want the width to be equal to 600. So now it's going to be the same width as my image was down here. And you'll see that it's automatically figured out the height based on the width. So that's good. The next thing that I want to do is I want to tell the browser that I'd like it to automatically play this video. So I'm going to set autoplay on the video element. When I do that, you'll notice that the video begins as soon as the page loads and it just goes and plays like that. Another thing that I could do is I could say that I want to be able to control this video. I want to be able to pause it, play it, move it forward or backward. So what I can do is I can say that I want controls to be added to the video. And when I do that, you'll see that now when I hover over this video, I have a set of controls and I can scrub through the video and move to different sections. I could make the video full screen. I can mute it. I can pause it. I can play it. So you have a lot of control. Like I could get rid of autoplay, but I could put up controls. And what it'll do is it'll, it'll have the video here, but you have to start it. So you, the user has to opt into playing this video before they're allowed to do it. I don't have any sound turned on, but if I wanted to, I could get rid of the sound by muting it. So when it comes up, it could be muted. And you'll see that now in the control section here, it's automatically been muted. So you have a lot of different things that you can do when you're playing with um, putting video and audio and so on into a page. Um, I don't have a, a like a great audio. Audio works the same way. So if I were to, if I, I would just use audio instead of working with video like this, but I'll just do it with video for purposes of today. Now these, when, when you're working with video and audio and images, there's lots more we can do than what I'm showing you today, but I just want to get you started, give you a feel for what's there. All right, let me show you one, another thing we can do as we wrap up H2. We can also embed content from other sites. So let me show you what I mean. Um, I'm going to put I'm going to put a YouTube video inside of my page and I'll play this inside my page here. So in this case, I've got not a video, but I have, um, I have an iframe. So an iframe is like there's another web page embedded inside of my page that I have here. And so we could change, let's change the width of this to 600. Um, and let me see if I can get this to do what I want. Oh no, I need to give it a height, so I won't do that. I don't wanna mess with that, so we'll leave that alone. So I can, I can have different media types in a page. Like I can have, you know, YouTube, a YouTube video in a page and I can have um, a native video that's playing in a page and I can have images in my page and all kinds of different text, etc. And what I'm doing with all of these is I'm using markup to be able to specify how I want content to be displayed, how I want it to be interpreted, I'm giving meaning to things. I'm providing structure like different heading level structure or specifying that something is supposed to be an ordered list or an unordered list, that I have hyperlinks. I want to link to different websites. I want to link to different pages in this site. I want to link to different parts of this particular page. All of that I can do 
using HTML uh, elements. So this week we're starting, to, we're starting in, we're learning about some of these and we're gonna come back to more and more of them as we go through subsequent weeks. So I'd like you to play around with them this week and get used to the kinds of things that are possible when you're building these pages. Again, we're not worried so much about how it looks. This page doesn't have a lot of style yet. It's just got a bunch of content in it in different ways, addresses, quotes, text, videos, images, and so on. But we're starting to get the major building blocks that we need in order to be able to build more complex web pages and web apps.